In 1867, my great-grandfather, Hermann Kahn, moved from Mannheim to Frankfurt to open a branch of the bank, Kahn and Sons, in Frankfurt. His older brother, Bernhard, stayed in Mannheim to run the bank in Mannheim. And 20 years earlier, in 1848, those two brothers were revolutionary firebrands, freedom fighters, in the revolution of 1848 in Baden. And now they were bankers. The trajectory of the Kahn family ran from democratizing sleep by processing bed feathers via revolution, violent revolution, to banking. Banking, I'm not quite sure what it means. I think it probably means wealth managing. It's not banking in the usual sense. Uh, not what we think of as a bank, a merchant bank. But it could also be an investment house or something. Uh, they spent a lot of time at that stock exchange. Okay, that was my great-grandfather Hermann and his son Bernhard was uh, carried on the bank in Frankfurt and he was the father of my mother, Ida Khan, and of Emil Khan. And they moved from Mannheim, which was a reasonable town on the Rhine, to Frankfurt, which was a large financial center, then as it is now. And it was a large town and a civilized town along the river Main, M-A-I-N not far from the Rhine. And that was a very good move because Frankfurt had a lot of money and money is what the Kants were interested in as well as other things, but bankers are interested in money. Uh, Frankfurt had an East End and a West End. And the East End was characterized by the old ghetto. The ghetto really meant one street, the Jew street. It didn't exist anymore. Throughout the century, it existed in 1800, but by 1867 it didn't exist anymore. But still, it was a Jewish area. And it was a Jewish area among a lot of poor Jews. And as the anti-Semitic government of the Tsar got worse and worse and worse. Uh, a lot of Jewish refugees from Russia and Poland, which was really the same, uh, Poland was part of Russia, uh, settled in Frankfurt. So there were a lot of Eastern Jews in Frankfurt who hardly spoke German. They spoke Yiddish or, or, or their own language, Russian, um, Polish. And okay, that was now when old Hermann Kahn came from Mannheim, he did not go to the poor Jews in the East End, he settled in the West End. Now, the West End of Frankfurt is a civilization of its own. And three years after old Kahn settled in Frankfurt, 1870, there was a war, Prussian, German, and Prussian French war. And after that, Germany was unified and there was a huge boom. And the period from 1870 to 1914 is one of extraordinary prosperity. And the Khans were among those, and there were many, many others, who benefited from the boom, the German boom, that followed the unification of Germany, which up to then had been about 357 little principalities, and it became unified. And 
business boomed and they got quite rich, as did many others, many others. And the West End of Frankfurt, the streets in which we grew up, where it was largely built in those years. Uh, there were a lot of building in the 80s and 90s, uh, uh, and the architecture is interesting. Now, I have a friend called Sylvia Tenenbaum, who now lives in New York, and she wrote a book called Yesterday Streets, and it dealt with the West End of Frankfurt and its civilization. And she did a lot of the research for that book by looking at blueprints of the architecture, of the, the way she could, she could conclude from the way the houses were built what the life was like, how they lived, from the way the, 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 the relative sizes of the rooms, the servants' quarters, etc. And she and it's most intriguing, intriguing how she did it. May I mind you, she had a few people who remembered, but she said her main source was the way the buildings were built, and they were built in the time between 1870 and 1914. And in the West End of Frankfurt, old Hermann Kahn found a house, and there was a fairly sizable house, not far from the opera, along the great artery uh, from, from, from the opera to the Pockenheim, it's called Pockenheimer Landstraße, it still exists. And that house was bombed in, during the Second World War, and I was told, I can't swear to that, I was told that by somebody who looked at the uh, at, the, at the ruins of that house in, eight, in 1946 or so, that the, in, in, the, in the place that was still habitable, habitable, there was a brothel for, this, for, the, for the benefit of the Americans occupying soldiers. Now, my great grandparents would not have been amused by that, and especially not, especially my great grandmother Henrietta. They were Victorian. <laughs> One can hardly let us not dwell on this. Anyhow, that was the house. And uh, Bernhard, the son, um, bought a house when he got married, right kitty corner from the old house. You could go from Bernhard's house, which was the house in which my mother, Ida, and Emil were brought up. They grew up there. You could go into the old people's house through the gardens. And my great-grandfather Hermann died in 1908, and old Henrietta died in 1916, and I was born in 1919, so I never knew them. And I never knew that house. I never knew that. I mean, I, I, knew, I knew what it looked like, but I was never inside that house. But the house I knew was the, the house where my grandparents, Bernhard and Anna, lived, and where my mother and Emil grew up. That house in the Niedenau I knew very well. About old man Hermann I know very little. I have seen pictures, I don't have one, of an old man with a black beard and I inherited from him only one thing. I inherited from him an edition of Shakespeare's plays in little blue leather-bound books. I have one right here and I've used it, and it's in English. Imagine Shakespeare in English. And they, old Hermann, had Shakespeare in English. This, And they were already, by the time they arrived in Frankfurt, they were already a totally assimilated, highly cultivated family who, who, who had Shakespeare in English. Because, as we all know, Shakespeare is much easier in German. I mean, for those of us who were born in Germany. <laughs> All right, now, that was old Hermann. And then Bernhard, and your Bernhard, the son, was 22, only 22, when he married my grandmother, Anna, whom he had met at a dance, a wedding in Mainz, 
in 1889 or so. I know this because my mother, Ida, was born in 1990. 1890, what am I talking about? 1890. And so my grandmother, so he was 22. Bernard was 22. And then, and then and he, and, 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 and he, he was a banker. And he died in 1917. And uh, I've talked about him before. But I've been trying to imagine life in that house, in Bernhard's house in the West End of Frankfurt. Now, Bernhard was uh, the opposite of a bureaucrat. He was a very slightly bohemian banker, but his lifestyle was very disciplined. So, for example, I'm told, I've been told by Emil, that uh, every morning at 7.20, he rang the bell four times, and so a maid would bring him the paper because he had to know the stock the stock exchange. He had to know. So, and he had one sweepback. Do you know what a sweepback is? It's a kind of rusk. He had one sweepback, and then he looked at the at the, at the uh, stock exchange prices, and then he went downstairs, and there was a samovar, and it was what was boiling, a kind of that was before electric kettles. And he poured himself a cup of tea, and he had his, set, his second tree back. And then he went for precisely 15 minutes to perform his ablutions, whatever that is. And then after 15 minutes, he came, he, he came out. He had a second, maybe the third tree back. And then he went on foot, no car, they didn't have a car. He walked to the his office, which was, I guess, a 20-minute walk or so to the bank. And then he, I think he may have gone there to the stock exchange in the morning, who knows. And then at 1.30, 1.30, they had their main meal. The main meal was at midday. And then he had to have a nap, of course. And he went back to his bank. And then I think at about 6 o'clock, he went to his club to play cards for an hour or so. And then in the, in the evening, about eight or nine, the, the evening meal was just cold cards, very simple. And that was his day. And, and uh, and my mother was very fond of her father. And Emil, I think, was a little more distant. There were three children. There was Ida, the oldest, and and Alfred, the next, who was to inherit the bank. Alfred was the next, and then five years later was Emil. Now, my mother, Ida, often talked about the frugality in this wealthy house. The frugality, they lived extremely modestly. The children... We're never, we're never, for example, if they had a, an apple or an orange, the children were never allowed to have two. And one day my mother had mentioned this more than once, that uh, I think the grandmother had a box of chocolates, lint chocolates, L-I-N-D-T, very good Swiss chocolate, a little pieces of chocolate, and... She offered my mother one. She was about six or seven. And my mother took the pure chocolate. And then while the grandmother was not looking, or while the grandfather was not looking, she took a second one. Uh, and this was seen. This was noticed. And the roof fell in. And she got a huge lecture, which she never forgot. And... It was suggested to her that if she carried on like that, a life of crime and sin and crime would follow. If she had to do it, and this is the kind of. They were very frugal, and my grandmother Anna Khan was frugal until the no luxury. No, 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 uh, the, the, the luxury. I mean, no extravagance. They were rich but frugal. Uh, it's well. A lot of money was spent on 
philanthropy and on 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 uh, f uh, financing f f cultural events, music, etc. There was a lot of music in that house because the three children each played an instrument. Uh, my mother played the piano very well, and Emil played the cello, and Alfred was a very good violinist, and I have inherited some of the m m music, so I can tell from the fingering, I can tell how good a violinist he was. And, they, and there was a lot of music in that house, and uh, I guess they went to concerts and opera and all that. Uh, now, it is my mother, let us mention that soccer. She went to a private school. The two boys went to the Goethe Gymnasium, a public high school, where they, to which I also, my, my brother Robert and I went to the same school. And, uh, and they, had, they went through the whole thing, and they had to learn French and Greek and Latin, of course. And they did a humanistic education. They got a very good school. Uh, and my mother then, you see, it was out of the question that a girl should go to the university. A girl of in that social milieu would go to the... Uh, women did not go to university, with some exceptions. My mother was not one of the exceptions. She went for one year to a school, a kind of a finishing school in Brussels to learn French. I mean, she already spoke French, but to perfect her French. And in that house, there was also Mim, whom I still knew. Mim was an English governess. They all learned English. They spoke English very well. They had English they learned as small children. Mim, whose name was Ethel Wilkins. And she was a very nice lady, and there was only one slight defect. She was quite deaf. So in my childhood, I thought when speaking English means speaking very loudly because Mim couldn't hear. But she brought up all those, I mean, she was involved in the bringing up these three children. And Wolf still remembers her well. She then retired to England, I think. I'm not quite sure how she left Germany for England. But I still visited her when she was very old. I still visited her in a suburb of London around when it must have been in 1939 or so. Uh, and that is the atmosphere. Now, when my mother was 18, 19, I must, it may, it may be a little, a young man appeared, my father, Otto Koch. And he came from a very different culture, different type. And he, he, he also played the violin, and I think they met through music because my mother accompanied him. And they knew each other because, a uh, small word, uh, my father was brought up a couple of blocks north of the Kahn house. And they knew each other. On the, but, and, and Otto Koch, from what I gather, was very interested in my mother. And my mother didn't hardly pay attention to him. And he pursued her. He waited for her at the street corner. He followed her wherever. And then one day they were playing music. And I know which music because my mother told me. The Spring Sonata by Beethoven. At the end of the second movement, as many of you know, there's a very difficult passage which you always get wrong. And, and either he or my mother got it wrong and they had to pause for a minute to get it right. But... They got engaged at that moment. They got engaged. He asked her to marry him, and she said yes. And then she announced this to her parents. She announced this to her father, who was furious that this would happen uh, in this improper way, because a normal way would be the young man would have to come to her and ask for her, his daughter's hand in marriage. But they... There was a preemptive strike, and they got engaged without the father's permission. Now, I understand he was furious. Old Bernhard was furious. And the grandmother, Henrietta, was triply furious because there was a social cleavage between the 
banker and a jeweller. Now, my father was second generation, a court jeweller, not just an ordinary jeweller, jeweller but an, a, a jeweller to the court, to the imperial court and to dozens of minor courts, to the king of Italy and all kinds of courts, and they were very snooty. And, and however, uh, that family, unlike Hermann, old Hermann, who already read, read Shakespeare in English, that family was not as cultured as the Khans. And they were a second, they were one generation behind. You see, the Khans were already cultured in Mannheim a generation ahead of it. The Kochs were not. The Kochs, to, to my great-grandmother Henrietta, a tough lady, the Kochs were parvenus. Also, they had an open store, a store, an open store, which is not as good as a bank. A bank does not have a store. Not a, so it was not quite as good as a bank. And so they, there's an amusing story about this. A, a scandal paper in Frankfurt got wind of this engagement and they made a joke. Well, you have to know German very well to get the joke. Kahn in German is also a word to describe a boat. And my father's name was Koch, Otto Koch. And Koch means cook, of course. And the headline of this little gossip was Der Kahn macht eine Kochparty. No, the other way around. The Koch macht eine Kahn party. So that means Koch goes for a boat ride. Koch goes for a boat ride. This was a joke. So they they were prominent enough, prominent enough, those two families, to warrant a little pun in the local in the local scandal sheet. So Every summer they went to Switzerland on holidays. And in the summer of 1914, July 1914, they went to Switzerland. And I think Bernhard was, Bernhard of course, stayed behind. And in, in what, let us say, middle of July, late July, they sent a telegram to wherever they were in Pontresina, in the Engadine, saying, I, 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 I come home and war, there may be a war coming. And my mother always said she remembers, she got in Zurich or somewhere, she saw, remembers the headlines. It was not, it was not a, a, a Sarajevo, but it was after that. And they went home, and you see the I mention this because this idyllic period, which began in 1970, this great boom time, boom town, the great prosperity of the Frankfurt West End, and the money they made in the bank and the money they made in the jewelry store, all this came crashing down in 1914, the end of the world, the end of, it was the end of something big. Alfred, the son, my mother's brother, who was born a year after my mother in 1891, he was to inherit the bank. And in 1912, just after my parents got married, he went to England, to the city of London, to London, to learn banking in the city of London. That's where you learn it. For two years, for two years he was in London. And then in July 1914, he came home because there was about, about to be a war. He felt the war was in actually here to come home, to join up. And he joined up. And in the summer of 1918, he was killed. 
And when he was in England, he had a friend. He played tennis. He was a great tennis. He was a great sportsman. He played tennis with Jim, Jimmy Balfour, the nephew of the former Prime Minister, Lord Balfour, who was, I think, Foreign Minister for a time during the war. And for some reason, Alfred Kahn and Jimmy Balfour made friends. And when, when he left in July 1914 to go home to serve the Kaiser, he left all his things, tennis rackets and clothes and whatever he had, with Jimmy Balfour. And in 1920 on 21, Jim Balfour sent the things, the belongings of Alfred Kahn to his mother, Anna Kahn, on the Bockenheimer Landstrasse in Frankfurt, in the West End. 